I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue is L.A. Mayor Karen Bass on homelessness, crime, strikes, and more. Plus, conservative commentator Steve Hilton on his efforts to fix California. The Issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Joining us now is the leader of the largest city in California, Mayor Karen Bass. Welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you for having me on. All right, so the biggest issue, of course, is homelessness. Yes. Uh, you said you wanted to have 17,000 people housed in your first year. How is that going? Are there now fewer people on the streets than when you took over? Well, um, I think there are definitely fewer encampments. I can say that for sure. We have cleared a number of encampments. We have many, many more to go. But what we're doing is we're not just shuffling people around. We are getting people housed. And, uh, but that's just one part of our overall strategy. The other one is to break through the bureaucracy and red tape that has kept people from being housed when there are actually vacancies. So working with the federal government to get that done. Let's t talk about each of those. One of the big things you did recently was the purchase of the Mayfair Hotel. Yes. Some $80 million the city spending to take that over. What is that going to look like? When's that going to be operational? Uh, sometime next year. I would say within the first quarter of next year. But what the idea is is that what LA lacks is a system of interim housing where individuals could stay for a year, a year and a half. Motels are not the long-term answer. That's just what we're doing in the emergency phase to get people off the street. So we need more Mayfairs. That's the difference between L.A. and New York, by the way. New York years ago invested in interim housing. We need to do the same thing here while we are fast-tracking permanent housing. For people that are concerned that's a little pricey, what do you say? Well, you know what? How much it costs for people to be on the street? How much it costs in terms of compromising people's quality of life, impacting businesses, the fact that people die on the streets, the emergency room, the police visits? Homelessness costs the city millions of dollars. Uh, you talked about the federal government. Um, during the campaign, we interviewed you and the Secretary of Housing, Marsha Fudge. Yes. And there was this push to change the federal regulations to make it easier for people to get help. Without getting too wonky, can you explain <laughs> the change that has happened and what that means for people here? Yes. Well, my goal was to align all level of levels of government to address the crisis. And the federal government, the Housing Urban uh, Development Department, or agency rather, had a requirement that said you had to prove that you were poor. Well, if you've been in a, a hotel or on a street for years, why do I need to verify your income? Why do I need to ask you for a government-issued ID? Where on earth would you have it delivered to? So after working for months, after the Biden administration said they wanted to reduce homelessness by 25 percent, they have finally given us a waiver. So I am going to presume that you are eligible. I am going to house you, and then we will verify that you're poor, and we will get you a government-issued ID because you'll actually have an address that it can be mailed to. If the challenge is clearly you're housing more people, but mm -hmm. sometimes the issue is more people then become homeless. I know. More people end up on the street, more people move in here from other states. Do we need to do something more radical, something well, bigger to well, make a dent in this? We absolutely need to do things that are bigger, but I will tell you that that is my greatest fear, and I know it is happening because the COVID protections went away, and we have thousands of people now facing evictions. So I am working on that, though. We do have a program, and we have a, a separate organization that is working to prevent those people who are facing eviction from falling into homelessness. We know who they are. We have grassroots organizations going out and speaking with them and trying to help them. And more information on that at mayorsfundla.org. That's and meanwhile, right. Meanwhile, I know you're also working with Governor Newsom. This is a statewide issue as well, right. obviously, homelessness is. And we're looking at potential propositions for next year. Yes. What are we looking at? I am at? very happy to say that there will be two ballot initiatives. People ask me all the time, but what about mental health? So help is on the way. In March, voters will have an opportunity to vote for a bond that will allow us to build the facilities that have been committed to five decades ago. There will also be another ballot initiative that will allow for flexibility with funding that already exists so that we can get the people who are profoundly ill off the streets before they die on these streets or before they hurt other people. 
Meanwhile, while that's happening, you've also got Hollywood on strike, yes. LA's signature <laughs> issue. Uh, I know you have been back and forth with leaders on both sides. Can that's you give right. us an update in terms of where we're at? Sure. Well, first of all, the impact on our economy is just profound. I mean, this is one of our foundational industries. And so I have been in contact with the both unions as well as the studio executives. And I know it seems really rocky right now because there have been negotiations. They breakdown. But I will tell you that I think we're in a better position today than we were a month ago or even a few weeks ago because at least they are at the table. Another issue we've been looking at recently is retail theft. Right. We have these images of people breaking into retail stores, grabbing as much as they can and, and running out. You put together a retail theft task force with law enforcement from the entire region working on this issue. But just foundationally, why do you think this is happening? Well, be, uh, you know what? Things like this happen when there's profits to be made. And, and law enforcement put the task force together that I'm supportive of. And it has a number of different agencies, the city attorney, the district attorney, et cetera, all at the table. And I will tell you that just the other day they made 11 arrests. And so these are crimes that are significant. They are felonies. They are not misdemeanors. And one of the things that we need to look at, though, rest assured, they are not selling $10,000 purses in poor communities. They're selling those purses online. They're selling those st stolen goods online. And so I believe when you have a crime like that, all of the actors are culpable and need to be uh, dealt with. And so we need to look at the online sales of stolen property because that's what it is. You know there are a lot of viewers that are, feel like there aren't enough consequences for crime in Los Angeles. What do you say to those people? Well, you know, they especially focus on that with these uh, retail crime. I think that there's a lot of misunderstandings about that. These are felonies and in some cases, especially when bear spray was used and other, these are, are, are crimes that do have major consequences. The reforms that people object to have nothing, nothing to do with these crimes. And when we're talking about reform, talking about things like Prop 47 and some of the bail issues as well. Um, on the issue of crime and punishment, you have supported and passed a budget that actually improves uh, LAPD pay, mm -hmm. gives incentives uh, for people to come work for law enforcement. Why do you think we have seen this drop off of people joining the force? And what is your message to the folks that are prospective police officers in Los Angeles? Well, let me just say that what we're experiencing is nationwide. Sure. This is not particular to Los Angeles. And we started seeing this a few years ago and officers talk about being demoralized and feel like they're not supported. But what's happening in LA though, and I know that there's a, a, a measure of that, but in LA, uh, our officers are being recruited by other agencies. So we have become less competitive. That was the reason to raise the pay, provide incentive pay, and then also encourage our officers not to retire early but to stay on the force. And you know, we are now below 9,000 officers and we haven't had that a drop like that uh, in over a couple of decades. And so you say to people, come work for us? Absolutely, yeah. and that we will pay you and that there's an incentive to come work for the force. Do you miss D.C. at all? <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> I, I certainly miss my friends. I miss the uh, foreign policy work. But I have to tell you, one thing that I was surprised by uh, with the job is how much uh, work in foreign relations that I do. I mean, of course, this is an international city, but I didn't anticipate meeting with foreign delegations um, very frequently. You know, we talked a lot when you were in that last role, when you would interact interact with former President Trump when he was president. This yes. week, his mugshot <laughs> comes out. Uh -huh. What went through your mind when you looked at his mugshot? It looked like his campaign photo. I mean, I think he was posed, and of course, he marketed it two seconds after he took the picture. So I think he viewed it as a win, and it's just a sad state that people would actually, I mean, he has, what, 91 indictments or something like that? that people would even consider putting somebody like that in the White House. So you didn't, you're not buying the merchandise? You're not uh, buying the no. t-shirt? That, <laughs> that that. What do you make of the fact that a lot of the folks who say law and order, law and order, law and order, and they criticize you often uh -huh. for that, are now saying he should not be prosecuted for this? Well, I mean, I think it's the height of hypocrisy to say that you support law and order for everybody except for the most powerful person in the world, which is who the president is, not who he is. 
Well, we're going to talk more with Mayor Karen Bass when we come back. You know we like to play music on this show, so who's your favorite musician? <laughs> Stevie Wonder. So we go to break with some Stevie Wonder, more of Mayor Karen Bass, and we come back here on The Issue Is. <laughs> Obama campaign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my yeah, yeah. My biggest concern is is that people will be a little dismissive and go out when we need people to stay at home. LA Mayor Karen Bass leading the city's response to Tropical Storm Hillary, the first tropical storm to hit Southern California in over 80 years. Mayor Bass is back with us. Uh, even that, that happened like less than a week ago. It feels like a million years <laughs> exactly, ago. Exactly, uh, it does. <laughs> what were the lessons learned from Hillary? Well, the most important lesson for us as Angelinos is that now we have to consider other uh, major weather events that we're not used to at all. I mean, when does it rain in the summertime? And the idea that we would even think about a hurricane? So I think that that was the reality check, is that we watch this happen in other parts of the country and we don't think it could happen here. Well, now it can. You know, there are some people who say that, mm -hmm. that we sort of overreacted to this. Um, how do you balance the messaging in terms of not having boy who cried wolf so that people trust you when you say, take this seriously? Well, you know what, I think that it was critically important. Again, having our region having never experienced this before, I'm happy that we were extremely prepared. prepared. And I have to tell you, the, our fire chief, Kristen Crowley, just did a wonderful job in sounding the alarm, bringing everybody uh, on board. But um, we had never experienced this before. We didn't know if the hurricane was going to shift in our direction or go someplace else. I'm sure people in the other, uh, other parts of the country that experienced this all the time looked at us and said, let's see what they're going to do over there. They know earthquakes. They well, don't know anything about hurricanes. Well, and their infrastructure is more built for hurricanes. Our infrastructure is not because we haven't experienced that before. And We've we got, had an earthquake, too. Right, I know, in the <laughs> middle of it. Uh, meanwhile, we have a picture of the fire chief uh, you're talking uh -huh. about, Kristen Crowley, who, of course, uh, is a woman. Uh, the chair of the Board of Supervisors, Janice Hahn, is a woman. That's you getting a call from the Vice President of the United States, who, of course, is a woman. Uh, <laughs> after spending so much of your career working predominantly with men mm -hmm. in these high-profile positions, what's the difference of working with female leaders? Oh, well, first of all, it was just an absolute pleasure working with the chief and working with the board chair. Um, I think we collaborate instantly. We're very supportive of each other. I spend a lot of time supporting the chief, promoting her, and the same with Janice. So I think it's, it's the collaboration that I think is different, is a gender difference. Not as much ego? <laughs> Not as much <laughs> ego. But you know, just, just wanting to be very supportive of each other. Uh, and, you know, you've been in this job now eight months. You're obviously the first female mayor of Los Angeles. The former mayor, Eric Garcetti, said nothing had quite prepared him to be mayor, and he had been the president of city council. You'd never even worked in city government before. Exactly. What's been the biggest surprise being in the job? Uh, well, just the magnitude of the job, of course, but, uh, but also just the support and goodwill that I experience everywhere. I mean, one from the public, but also from people who I feel are really invested in, in me succeeding as an individual, but L.A. turning a new page. And, uh, and that's just been wonderful. And I do feel that my experience that I've had uh, over my lifetime has helped me tremendously so far in the job. What's been the biggest challenge? Um, I think the biggest challenge has been the homeless issue and the fact that how do we get to scale with 46,000 people. I see the pathway, but how do we get to scale? What's been the best part? The best part, again, is just the, the goodwill. And for me, it just feels wonderful because I'm working on issues that I have worked on um, from a distance for so many years. And now I get to be on the ground seeing the difference every day. We talked a lot during the campaign, which is one of the great joys of the campaign, was getting to know your family, uh -huh. uh, including here on the show. I think the first time they'd ever done a TV interview was with us. Right. How are they doing? How are they adjusting, especially your, your grandsons? <laughs> you know what? They're doing well. They still want to hang out with me. They still want to come to all of my events. Uh, but, you know, the family has been uh, well. And, and in my life, they had never been interested in politics or the things I was doing. But now they're very attuned, very involved. And, of course, this was their idea 
that it you sure do was. this. So now they've got to help you <laughs> in right. the job as well. There are your grandsons right That's there. Right. Um, well, Mayor, it's, it's always great catching up with you. Thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Up next, conservative commentator Steve Hilton is here. But first, more music. And, and you had at your inauguration. That's Stevie right. Wonder That's playing right. the inauguration, living in the city. Doesn't get better than that. So we'll play some of that as we go to break. Here's Stevie once again. To keep us strong, moving in the right direction. But there's just enough, just enough for the city. Are you in the same outfit? No. <laughs> okay. There's nowhere better than California. But everyone knows things are going off track. Fox News contributor Steve Hilton formed a nonpartisan organization called Golden Together to help fix some of the issues impacting the Golden State. Wait, there are issues? Uh, Steve joins us here in studio for the first time. Steve, welcome back to The Issue Is. Great to see you. Um, so we know that you helped David Cameron back in the day. Gosh, uh, seems like an age ago. Fix in England, the UK yeah. or work on the UK. Now you're focused on California. What is Golden Together? So I've been here now. We, we moved here with, our, with my family just over 11 years ago. I've been a citizen, a proud American for two and a half years. When we moved here, um, and even after that, I think we all knew that California represented something amazing, not just uh, to America and the people obviously who live here, but to the whole world. It was as, as a beacon of hope and inspiration all the positive things we think about uh, when it comes to California. But recently, as I was saying there, it just feels to everybody that things have gone off track. And so I thought, with my experience working in government back in the UK and here in America, starting a company in Silicon Valley where I live, I can actually make a contribution to solving some of these problems in a positive and practical way. A lot of the time in politics, it's also divisive or yelling at each other. Let's try and find solutions to some of the big problems like housing and homelessness and so on that people can get behind. So what specifically does that look like? What does that mean? What are you targeting? So Golden Together will be uh, developing and promoting a number of ideas on a number of these issues. But the big one and the one we're going to start with is the housing crisis. Because in many ways, the housing crisis, the fact that it's impossible to actually uh, get, get on the housing ladder for most people, if you can get on the housing ladder, it's so expensive. Let's try and get rid of some of the barriers to building affordable housing. So there's going to be some details on that in the next few weeks. But that's going to be an example of how we're trying to do something that isn't really partisan, that people can just focus on something practical we can do to solve the problem. So if I'm hearing you right, maybe some sort of ballot proposition to lessen regulations on housing? It's in the works. Okay. So, uh, so <laughs> when, when we when we finalized it, which, it, which we're close to doing, be happy to come back and tell you all about it. Okay. But that's an example. And of course, there's so many other issues. We can't do everything. But the idea is to do it in a way that we can get beyond the partisan um, barriers and really bring people together. In the meantime, since we have you here uh, as somebody who's a conservative thought leader on, on one of the most historic weeks yep. in the recent Republican Party. Donald Trump's mugshot <laughs> is put out there, which is like a Rorschach test for, for people. What went through your mind when you saw that? And, and why? how do you think conservatives are reacting when they see it? You know, to me, Alex, it was just a massive shame, a real shame. I think that the most conservatives look at that and say, it's unfair. Donald Trump should never have been uh, prosecuted. Look at all the other wrongdoing on the other side. Why isn't that being investigated? There's a double standard and so on. And then people on the other side say, of course he should be uh, prosecuted. No one's above the law. And this debate just goes on and on. And I don't see any sign of it being settled. And that's what's depressing. In some ways, you see signs of it intensifying and ramping up and the divide getting even worse. Yeah. Uh, and you saw some of that on the GOP debate stage this week. Obviously, Trump wasn't there. What's your analysis of the guys that that were there? Well, I think there's no question that the guy who, if you like, won the debate in the sense of really dominating the whole conversation, both when he was speaking and when everyone else was attacking him and did what he needed to do, was Vivek Ramaswamy. So the trajectory going into that debate was Ramaswamy moving up, Ron DeSantis moving down. And I think that that trajectory was certainly not changed and may have been accelerated. So in that sense, Vivek Ramaswamy is the winner, but 
he may have said some things that may uh, cause a problem if he somehow became the nominee and had to appeal to a wider audience than just the Republican base. Meanwhile, Mike Pence, Donald Trump's vice president, sort of represents the old school version yeah. of the Republican Party. He quotes Ronald Reagan, tries to take it back to another era. You say, get off the stage. Well, first of all, everyone quotes Reagan, so I hope yeah. <laughs> you make yeah. promise when we quote Reagan as well. Look, the thing about Mike Pence that I've always thought is that he's just completely fraudulent. He comes across as this holier-than-thou, preachy kind of guy. Actually, he was the meanest person on the stage if you look at the personal attacks. There is no chance whatever that he is going to win this nomination. I don't know why he's doing it. I don't think he's making any contribution. All the substantive policy arguments he made were made better by Nikki Haley. So I just think he should get out. Okay. <laughs> on that note, we do want to get to know you a little bit better uh, here on the show. We play a game called Personal Issues. Uh -huh. This is 30 okay. seconds, rapid fire questions about your personal favorites. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Yes. What is your all time favorite TV show? Um, I'm going to say The West Wing. Ah, oh, the best. Favorite movie? Oh, dear. This is going to date me uh, Moonstruck. Favorite athlete? Actually, I'm going to change that. Uh, that used to be Grand Budapest Hotel. Favorite athlete? Athlete. Um, I'm going to go with Serena Williams. Musician? Tom York, Radiohead. What is the best British dish of all time? Oh, my gosh. That has to be bangs and mash. OK, very nice. Steve, great to see you. Congratulations see you, on Golden you. Together. People can reach out for more information on that to be a part of that movement as well. We go to break with one of my favorite musicians, Dave Matthews. We'll have more of The Issue Is right after this. Next week on The Issue Is, the leader of the California Senate, Tony Atkins, will be with us. It has been a tough news week with big, heavy stories, but let's end with something to celebrate. College football's back this weekend. The glory days return for the young guys out on the field. So we end with some highlights from my alma mater, USC, and the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, Caleb Williams. Fight on. We'll see you next week.